briefly, just want to reintroduce myself. Uh, my name is Ryan Fulmer. I'm the student minister here at the St. Albans campus. Uh, on a day like today, there's an opportunity that I get to uh, join you and the students uh, get to join you guys as we celebrate our grads and, and the things they've done. But, you know, I was, uh, uh, I've been asked to speak today just with them being involved. And, and so we're going to be looking through just a few verses in, in Hebrews uh, chapter 12. Um, but we're not doing necessarily a graduation sermon because there's not really a text in the Bible that talks necessarily about graduation. Uh, but what we do know is life has a lot of big moments. Life has a lot of, of exciting things that happen. And as life, as the author of Hebrews is going to talk about, is a race that we're going to run. But in that race, there's just a lot of big things that go on. Uh, obviously, the birth or adoption of a child. And you know, we're going to celebrate that next week. Uh, I want you guys to come celebrate that with us as we do uh, baby dedication or family dedication next week. That's a, that's a huge uh, thing that has gone on in so many of our lives. First steps for a child, first day of school, first lost tooth, first date, high school graduation, marriage, first kid. So many big things that go on in our lives. And I think what we know about life is it's just ever changing, ever moving forward, ever pushing uh, and we just feel like everything changes. The people in our lives change. Maybe the places that we live change. The relationships that we have change. But we want to make sure that we are establishing the one thing, the one person who never changes. So as, as we look at maybe grad rec per se, but as a church family today, we want to see a, that we are firmly planted on the one who never changes, Jesus Christ. That is our only hope and our only goal to understand this world and pursue it properly and to walk through it correctly. You see, as, as kids grow, they outgrow their clothes, right? They outgrow their crib. Uh, you maybe even outgrow TV shows. You become too old to watch. You outgrow relationships, but we will never outgrow Jesus. We'll never go beyond our need for him as we run the race. And as you guys begin to step out into the world, especially in this culture that's ever trying to push God out, they're going to tell you, you need to outgrow God. God's just kind of those fairy tales you grow up with, like, like the tooth fairy uh, and other things your parents told you about that just to help you get by. But you need to give up on God because He's not real. Just like you need to give up on the fact that you're never going to be a princess and boys, you're never going to be an astronaut. And just give up. God's not there. What we understand is from a Christian point of view, without Christ, we have nothing. Without Christ, we have no purpose. Without Christ, we have no hope. And so today we want to look at this race that we're running together um, not necessarily as a graduation text, but it's just a life text. And I don't have any great, deep, new spiritual insight. I just simply practical what we all need to be reminded of, things every day of our lives, and what it means to follow Christ, to, to obey Christ, and to love Christ. Because that's what it's all about. So we're going to look at Hebrews. And Hebrews is one of my favorite books. Hebrews basically can be summed up in this. Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament law, and is supremely greater than anyone or anything else. Jesus goes far beyond taking care of all of our needs in every part of our lives. You know, in the Old Testament law, they had to sacrifice animals. They had uh, to go through different ritualistic activities. They had to abide by certain codes of conduct and of rule that Jesus has fulfilled and gotten rid of. And also, he is greater than Moses. He's greater than Abraham. He's greater than Adam. He's greater than any other man that's walked the earth because Jesus is God. And Hebrews is a great book of pushing us back to that over and over and over again. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at Hebrews 12, verses 1 through 3. I want to read our text for this morning as we talk about this race we're running in as humans, as Christians. And I want to pray for us. So let's, let's read the text together. It'll be on the screen. It'll be on your phone. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that we may not grow weary or faint-hearted. Let's pray. Father, it is, it is my ask this morning that as, as we get into your word, as we study your word, that your word will be active, will be living, will be piercing us down uh, to the spirit, Lord, that you will, be, um, you will be active in our listening and in our hearing, and that you will be working in our hearts, that we will become more like you. 
and you will be glorified in what's done here. So, Father, speak to us now through your word for your glory and for our joy. So, Jesus, then we pray. Amen. So the author here, the writer here of Hebrews, we're not positive who it is. Many people think it's Paul, but we're not positive. He doesn't sign his name on this like he does on his other letters. Um, but here the author tells us that race, or that life is a race. Life is an ongoing, never-ending trek. He talks about endurance. We have to run with endurance. It's the idea it's going to be hard. You're going to have to keep going when you don't want to. You're going to have to push forward when you don't want to. I mean, uh, if anything's true for, for maybe college freshmen, you're going to have to go to class when you just don't want to, right? There's a lot of things you have to do. You just don't want to. But this idea of, uh, that we are running a life, uh, a race of, with Christ together as a church, it's endurance, and it's hard, and it's all your whole life. It's until you leave this world, until Christ comes back, we'll be running a difficult life. And in all reality, the difficulty of life is, is something that as you get older, you understand more and more. And the older you are, the more you've been in this world, the more you understand life's just going to be hard. Uh, you know, I, I just asked the questions in, in the first service in this idea that, you know, whose marriage didn't work out like you thought it would? Whose kids didn't turn out like you prayed they would turn out? You know, whose job didn't last like you thought it would? Whose health is not where you thought it would be at this point in your life? Whose finances are just not adding up to like you always assume they would? The longer you live, the more we're going to experience the pain of this life. I, I recall on a Wednesday a night, we do small groups in the student ministry. On a Wednesday night, um, when we meet, I meet with my adults to start. And there was an evening, there's probably about 12 of us in a side room, just as adults. And we always kind of talk about what's going on in life pray for each other, and just get ready to go and, and minister to our students. And, you know, like I said, there's probably 12 of us in there, and it seemed like every single adult in that room had something major going on in their life. This, I mean, whether it be disease, whether it be family issue, whether it be uh, adoption struggle, there was just something heavy. And I remember to the point in tears saying, no one told me life would be this hard. No one told me. But it is. And I don't say that in a way to be pessimistic. I mean that in a way to be realistic. If you're going to walk through this world, the simple reality is it's just going to be hard. And oftentimes, pain is a great unifier for people. But for the church, pain is not our unifier. Christ is our unifier. Our hope found in Jesus is our unifier. What I, see is, what I, want, to, what I want us to not miss in this text is that this text shows us that this is something we are doing together. There's a lot of we's and us and our in this. It says, since we are surrounded, let us lay aside, let us run the race that is set before us. Talking about Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. This is a faith that we don't outgrow, we don't move past. And just because you're in one stage of life doesn't mean you're not connected with people in another stage of life. This is a we text because our faith is communal. We live it as a church. So I'm not looking today to pick out a per certain group of people and say, this is for you, this is for us. We are running this race together. Some of us may be six, some of us may be 60. But we are in the same race running together. But in that, in this race we run, there are those who are stumbling and hurting and not running so well. And there are those who are currently running well and need to come alongside those who are hurting and not doing so well. But what I want us to do is look at three things that the author in Hebrews here gives us to help us continue running this life, continue running this race in such a way that brings God glory and brings us joy. And the very first one is very simple. And he calls us just to simply remember the cloud. Remember the cloud. This is in verse, verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses... Now, what we maybe not understand is it wasn't until like the 1500s we had numbers in our Bible as far as chapters and verses. Before that, the, the letter of Hebrews would just read like a letter. It wasn't broken up. I think what happens with those numbers, we kind of miss the fact that these are continuous thoughts that are running into each other. We need to read the book as a whole to understand what's going on. So when we get to chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, it's easy for us to get that what the author is referring to is chapter 11. So he says, uh, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. So we need to ask, what, what's, why does he say therefore? What's he referring to? There's something that comes before. And who is this great cloud of witnesses? The author calls us to remember something. 
But we want to look back at chapter 11, just very briefly. I want to talk about chapter 11. As many people know, it's like the, the faith chapter or the hall of faith. There's a lot of things about faith in chapter 11 that leads us into this idea that we need to remember this great cloud. See, the, the faith chapter uh, has verses in it like, uh, now faith in chapter 1, or verse 1 is, faith is the assurance of things hoped for and convictions of things not seen. Or 11.6 says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. And the author goes on to talk about people in the Old Testament that we would know of, like Abel, or Noah, or Abraham, or Moses, men of faith, who went through great difficulty, who were sinners, but who endured the race by faith. They continued by faith. I mean, think about Abel. Abel was murdered by his own brother for giving a better sacrifice through faith. Noah was mocked for building a boat. He then got on this boat and had to endure the wrath of God being poured out on the world and then just to start over from nothing with just he and his family. Abraham was called out of his homeland into a foreign land, was given a promise. He had to wait years and years to see fulfilled in a son. And then God asked him to sacrifice that son and by God's grace provided for that sacrifice instead of Isaac. Moses should have been killed as a child. He endured 40 years in exile for being a murderer, right? He killed someone and then ran. He then returned to free his people and then found himself back in the wilderness for 40 years with a complaining, unhappy people and just to die at the edge of the promised land because of his sin. We had this great cloud of, of witnesses, this great cloud of faith that, in, that goes through the whole Old Testament. We have other people like Elijah and Esther and David and Isaiah and Jeremiah. We look to the New Testament at the apostles and at Paul and at Stephen. We look to church history and we see that there were people, there are men and women through the last thousands of years that have given up their life for us to be here. We realize that the original uh, translators of the Bible into English lost their lives for putting it into English. And maybe in your own family, part of your cloud is a family member who has gone on before you to be the Lord that endured the race till the end. You know, some people refer to Christianity as the faith that dies well, the people that die well, because we have such a hope beyond this world. Perhaps one of the greatest testimonies to us is a, is a family member who has endured to the end. Uh, Crystal had a grandfather who passed away a little over three years ago, and he is, in many ways, that for us. Great man of God, who spent his days as a retired man walking around the mall in Lynchburg, Virginia, telling them about Jesus. That's meeting people and telling them about Jesus. You give me the names of these people he met that weekend. This guy's a Muslim, and this guy's an atheist, and, I was, and just his faith to the end has been such an encouragement and a blessing to us. So we have to remember, we have to look in a way back at those that have come before us who, who have endured to the end. And this is not a crowd who sits around and cheers us on. There's not really biblical evidence that they sit up in heaven and clap as much as it's a hallway we walk through and we see the pictures, we remember their faith, we remember what they endured and how they endured to the end and how we can keep going because they've done so. And their work Till the end, we must be our encouragement to run the race well. So after we remember the cloud, we are also called to remove the chaos. Uh, chapter one, or verse one finishes finishes with, "Let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set." before us. There's that word endurance, that race set before us. There's something ahead of us. It's not just looking to the past to move forward. It's knowing that there's something ahead of us. There is a plan. There's a purpose. There's a route that has been put before us that we are to run. And there are two things here that the author tells us we need to get rid of to run this race with endurance. We don't run weighed down. We don't run with sin in our lives. We must remove the weight and the sin. Uh, the weight literally just means a hindrance or an encumbrance. This is not necessarily something that's wrong. This is not necessarily something that is sinful. This is just something that it simply slows you down. When you go to a track and field event, if you were to go to a track and field event, your thinner, faster people are going to be the ones running on the outside of the track, and your bigger guys especially are going to be the ones throwing shot put and discus and stuff like that. You don't put the big guys out on the track to run because the weight hinders them, prevents them from from running like we should. And it's really just a picture of maturity. You know, as a, as, a, as a marathon runner becomes more serious about racing, 
They watch their diet. They watch their dress, what they wear when they're running. They they pay attention to things like their sleeping habits. They pay attention to what they think about. The racing becomes more and more a part of their thought process. And the same is true for the Christian who's removing the chaos, removing the unneeded. There are going to be things that we put in our lives that are not beneficial to our race. It can be simple things like just too much TV. Again, not necessarily a sin, but as you get more mature and you grow in your faith, you, become, you maybe begin to watch less. Or uh, maybe there's friendships or relationships in your life that maybe they're not necessarily wrong, but they're not leading you to walk, run closer with Christ. They're hindering you. They're weighing you down. They're slowing you. About time management. You think about going to college. I think about my years in college. I was at Bible college. I think of all the time I wasted and the time I still can waste today. We want to get rid of these weights so that our focus becomes more on Christ. But what are the things in your life that are slowing you? They're not necessarily sin. They're just things you just need to give up because they're just not important. Again, I think age has to do with this. As we, as we grow and mature, we begin to care about less and less things in this world. As we see this world just is full of things that just fall apart and break and you lose them and you, they don't work anymore, you begin to see the unnecessary needs in this world that we just let go of. So we, we, we remove the weight that, that entangles us. That, I'm sorry, that hinders us. We also need to remove the sin. And this, again, is obvious. But the, the author is simply reminding us, you need to remove the sin that is preventing you from running in the way that Christ would have you run. Here, this is literally the word you'd be encircling or entangling the runner. You know, a runner that's entangled in something quickly stops being a runner and becomes like a speed bump, right? Once you get entangled, you begin to fall and not be able to run when you are wrapped up. The New American Standard Bible, which is a little more literal in the translation, um, says, uh, the, it says you need to get rid of the sin that is so easily entangles us, which brings in a definite article as if maybe there's a specific thing the, the author is trying to get us to see here. See, if any sin kept us from running, then none of us would ever be running, right? If you're anything like me, you are sinful to the core every day of your life, and there are things you struggle with. If I were to stop running every time I sin, I would never be running. But there seems to be something specific. And if the last chapter, chapter 11, is about faith, and faith is what we use to run, and faith in Christ is what we use to endure, what is the thing that so- stops us from running? It's our doubts. Doubt is the one thing that will absolutely hang you up, not just in your faith, but in your life. Right? If someone doubts the safety of an airplane to the point where they, they cannot get on the plane, they will never ride a plane, right? Because of their doubt. If my kids, I have little kids, when we go to the pool, if they doubt my ability to catch them when they jump in, they're not going to jump. Their doubt is going to hinder how they act, how they respond, how they move. And it's the same thing for us in our spiritual life. Doubt will absolutely paralyze us. And I want to speak about this from experience. You know, many of you are uh, aware of where I've been, where, what my family has been through the last few years. Um, we're super blessed to, today is actually the second uh, birthday of our youngest, Elijah, and um, what we've been through as a family has led me, if I'm really honest, into some really, really deep doubt. Watching a child die, watching my wife suffer mentally and emotionally in ways that I don't think any human should ever have to suffer, watching my house just be unsettled for months and months because we just can't get our feet back under us. There's a lot of doubt. I do begin to, I did. I doubted God's goodness. I doubted God's love for us. I doubted if God was really active in my life. It was because those times I began to focus on myself and not on Him. Doubt ultimately is a loss of sight, which we'll get to in a minute. But some things that carried me through those doubts are knowing I'm not the only one who doubts. Doubt is, is something that's throughout the Bible. King David doubted, right? If you guys, if you would read through the Psalms, you would see in one Psalm, David is, is joyously praising the Lord and grateful for his goodness and his closeness. And it's like the next Psalm, you like turn the page and he's like, God, where did you go? I leaned on David. Paul talks about, I was perplexed, but not crushed, right? I mean, Paul, who saw the risen Savior on the road as he was being transformed, Still was perplexed. Still didn't understand why. Why am I in jail? Why am I being beaten with rods? Why am I shipwrecked? He's perplexed by what goes on in his life. Still, I think Jesus, to an extent, in his human nature, 
dealt with doubt in the, in the garden before the, before the crucifixion, praying, Father, if there's another way. I found comfort in a, in a preacher from, from centuries past named Charles Spurgeon who openly would talk about in some of his books about dealing with depression and struggling with doubt. I found strength in friends and fellow pastors who have been honest that they've had similar struggles. See, doubt is something that is common to faith. Just as you cannot have light without dark, it almost you can't have faith without some doubt. And I want to encourage those that are struggling in those doubts to push, to walk, to, to look to the people of the Bible. Go to that cloud of witnesses we talked about. Go to those people that are in your life that have, and tell them you know, that you're close to and tell them what you're going, with, going through. And I think you'll find people can relate with doubt. I also think you can go to Christ because I think he can handle our doubts. He is not surprised. But we, uh, we have to remove the chaos. We can't live in doubt because eventually it will stop our running. After we remove the chaos, we go on to the one thing that ultimately is going to get rid of all of our doubt. The one thing that's ultimately going to rid us of our doubt is, is the third and final point this morning, that we have to refocus on Christ. And like I said, I don't have anything great and new this morning. I want to give you just a simple reminder for the Christian walk, for the Christian run, for the Christian faith, that it's all going to center around Christ. It says, looking to Jesus the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. Here's one of the beauties of our faith. The simplicity of the Christian faith is what I call the sufficiency of the Christian faith. The idea being the most simple parts of our faith are our faith, and they're all we need in our faith in many ways. The most simple things about who Christ is, the simplicity of the gospel, is also the sufficiency of our salvation and our knowledge and our understanding of God. And those few things that we hold on to as Christians above all other things, the deity of Christ, his death, burial, resurrection, his return for us, those few things are sufficient ultimately to carry us through. Here in these few verses, there's four quick things I want to point out that the author tells us to do to refocus on Christ as Christ followers. I'm going to to tell you what they are, and I'm going to talk about them briefly. What first thing he tells us to do, to focus on the founder and perfecter of our faith. And he also wants us to focus on the completion of Christ's work through the cross. He wants us to focus on the current seat of Christ interceding for his church. And he wants us to focus on a Savior who can relate to our situation. We have a God like any other God. We want to focus on the founder and perfecter of our faith. That is a beautiful thing. Jesus is our founder. He's our pioneer. He's our originator. He's the beginning of our faith. He is where our faith starts. And he doesn't just begin our faith. He is the one who perfects it. He completes it. He is the one who goes all the way through. He is our entire faith. Jesus is our faith. What Jesus has done is the whole foundation of our faith. He founds it, he starts it, he perfects it, he sees it through, and he completes it. Jesus is all of our faith. Like I said earlier, doubt is ultimately a lack of focus on Christ. Doubt is ultimately an inward focus most of the time. We begin to trust in ourselves and only what we can see, and you should doubt when you do that. You should doubt when you depend upon yourself because who's lied to you more in this world than you have? Who's deceived you more in this life than you have? You should doubt when you look at yourself. You should doubt when you depend on yourself. What we must do is refocus on Christ who founds our faith, who continues our faith, who completes our faith, who is all of our faith, that he is good and he is sovereign and he is able to walk us through anything and everything we go through. In all reality... There's nowhere we haven't been that he hasn't taken us there. We'll never, ever outgrow him. He is the founder and the perfecter of our faith. Also, we focus on the completed work of Christ through the cross. It says, for the joy set before him endured the cross. His joy, Jesus' joy, was to come to earth and painfully obey the Father, painfully live a life that we can live. He endured the cross Oh, to bring the Father glory, to pay for the sins of His bride. He came to live a life to pay for, the, pay for those whom He would ransom. 
We see that he completed it. He finished the work. Jesus didn't give us part of the work. He completes the work. He does everything that we need. Jesus is sufficient in all ways. John 17, 4 and 5 tells us this. This is Jesus praying to the Father the night before he dies. I have glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. He completed it. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Just as Christ's joy was to obey the Father, even when it was, even when it was hard, our joy ultimately will come in glorifying the Father, obeying the Father when life is hard. We're also called to focus on the current seat of Christ, the one who's interceding for the church. Romans 8.34 reminds us also, it says, Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. We have not just a Savior who came and started our faith and will finish our faith, not just a Savior who comes and completes the work on the cross. We have a Savior who then goes back to the Father and intercedes for His church, takes care of His church, knows His church, loves His church, and knows every part of your life. He knows everything going on. And as we seek Him, as we love Him, as we begin to know Him, we understand more and more He is interceding. He is speaking to the Father on our behalf. What greater reason do you need to take the focus off yourself and put it on the Christ? And he is the one who is at the feet of the Father, at the side of the Father, speaking, interceding, pleading, praying, loving his church to the Father. We're also called to focus on a Savior who can relate. It says, consider him. I love it. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. Again, ultimately, the endurance of this race of life following Christ is going to be considering Him, focusing on Him who suffered. Christ suffered. We should expect to suffer. But we do this so we do not grow weary or faint-hearted. We have a God who sees, who knows, who is interactive in every part of our lives. And ultimately, we will endure because we'll have our eyes on the goal of attaining Christ himself. So we run with endurance this lifelong race of faith. And what helps us is to remember the cloud. Remember those who have come before us. Remember those who have been there before you. We remove the chaos. We get rid of the things that weigh us down and the sin that keeps us from the Father, especially our doubt. And we refocus on, on the cross. We refocus on Christ. We refocus on what he has accomplished for us. See, the chapter 11 in Hebrews is the great faith chapter, but we don't put our faith in Abraham or Moses or the priesthood or our works or the law. We put our faith in Jesus. Jesus is the perfect Lamb of God, able to forgive and free us to run the race. Jesus alone is the one who can bring us to the Father. As he tells us, in, in John 14, a verse so many of us are familiar with, John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, I'm the path, and the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Jesus made it very clear in this world, there are two paths. Everyone is on a path, and it's leading somewhere. There is a wide path, a wide road that leads to destruction. There is a road that ultimately just leads to a cliff, to your own destruction, which is punishment away from the Father, forever. But the narrow road, the road that runs to life, is Jesus, is through Jesus, and with Jesus, and by Jesus. And what we want to call those that don't belong to him to each and every week is to push your faith in Jesus, to get onto the path that leads to life. It's narrow, but it leads to life and salvation. So we have two paths. So if you're on the narrow path already, if you belong to Christ already, then run. Run. And, and if you're running well, make sure you're encouraging those that you're running with. And if you're not running well, tell someone. Confess it to the Father. Seek your brothers and sisters in Christ and ask them to run alongside you to help carry you in this time. Carry those, uh, be asked to be helped, to be carried when you can't run well. And then when you are running well, search those that need you. And if you are not on the path, if you are not running the race of Christ, we want to call you to repentance. We want to call you to life 
in Jesus alone that he will give forgiveness of sin and eternal, eternal life forever and ever strictly through faith in Christ alone. If you have not put your faith in Jesus, we call you to that today. Whether, you're, whether again, you're six or 60, we call you to trust in Jesus. So what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to close. We're going to sing a song. I'm going to pray for us. Uh, the band's going to maybe come up and lead a song. And uh, we will, um, we're going to sing together and, and invite you, if you belong to Jesus, to, to continue running. And if you do not belong to Jesus, to put your faith in him today. Find life in him today. Um, so I'm going to pray for us. And then we're going to have a time of invitation if you want to come and trust in him today. So let's pray. Father, we, we want to honor you and glorify you uh, with all that we do. And Father, we thank you for sending your son who was sufficient and perfect for all that we need. And Father, for those that don't belong to you today, we ask uh, you draw them into yourself. Lord, you make much of yourself in this place and that you find, they find life in you this afternoon. Father, we love you. We just ask that as we close here today, that you will be glorified in all that's done. So in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as we close, we're going to invite you to stand up and sing with us. And if you have a decision you want to make, uh, there'll be a few of us down here. We'd love to talk with you and pray with you about what that means to follow Christ.